Hey guys, I'm Nick and welcome to my channel. As you already might see in the preview, today we are creating this spiral curve direction simulation setup. I saw a few uh, variations or versions of this effect, but I think originally it was posted in 2019 by Chris Harkin, um, username Charkin on Instagram and we will be creating something similar to this some beautiful curves here these are very thin like hairs or something yeah pretty pretty cool effect as always huge thank you to everyone who supports me purchasing my project files every project that you see on my youtube has its project files on Gumroad and you are very welcome to support me and i will be very grateful to every one of you who do that also, don't forget that subscribing, liking and commenting on this video, apart from project files, it's completely free. And YouTube algorithm somehow loves when you comment on my videos. So if you have any questions, recommendations, suggestions on what we should cover in the future tutorials, please feel absolutely free to let me know in the comments. So we are here in Houdini, we dropped a Geonode and let's dive inside and see what we get here. This setup is pretty easy. Um, it consists of two like major base uh, things, which is Pyra simulation and our PopNet simulation. So we will need a sphere and this sphere is primitive type set to polygon, radius set to 0, 05, frequency set to 10. And actually, in this case, you can go with like 5 or something. Let's leave it as 10. Uh, because I was trying to add a mountain node to kind of displace the surface of the sphere and displace the surface of our simulation starting point. So, but that's not that necessary, to be honest. So then we have a pyro source and uh, we should initialize smoke. And here you, you see this drop down, you can click and like select source smoke and it will create these density and temperature inputs. Particle separation is set to 0 0.05, not that high res, but we actually don't need super high res things here. So then this is a pretty interesting uh, little setup. So we have our point velocity. Point velocity displaces the pyro source. I added a curl noise here with a pretty big scale Scale is set to 80, pulse duration set to 0.5, swirl size to 5, swirl scale to 0 0.02. Offset, again, dollar time, because we want our noise to be animated over time. Grain set to 0.1, turbulence to 0.2, and mm, that's all, yeah. And don't forget to check this add coral noise here, of course. But point velocity is not an impulse force. It will continue applying this velocity that is constantly changing because of the noise throughout all the simulation and we don't want that we just want one impulse that will break the uniformity of our power source so that's why there's a switch node and the expression in the switch says frame more than two frame number more than two and what it gives us is that while the frame number is less than 2, we are using the input 0, which is point velocity. And when we get to the third frame, we will be using just our power source with its own velocity. So that's how we can simulate the impulse and we can, let's say if we type 10 here, we will have our point velocity influence our smoke for these first 10 frames. So yeah, that's why we just want these point velocity values for a few first frames. Then we drop a volume rasterize attributes. And here we have to add our attributes, which is density, P scale, temperature, position, and of course, velocity. Then we go to the pyro solver. First of all, the voxel size is set to 0.08. And here I can right click, select copy parameter, then go back to volume rasterize attributes. And here in the voxel size, click paste relative references and it binds this input here. And just for consistency, because these two inputs should be ideally set to similar values. I increase the substeps to be two. In sourcing, 
I set the limit source range and we are emitting smoke for these 30 frames. Um, source volumes, I think I added this volume 4, which is velocity. I think it should be here by default, but yeah, anyways. For the collision, um, limit collision range, I think nothing here actually changed. For the fields, density dissipation set to 0.01 and this is so our smoke is not dissipating, it, it remains, it keeps its shape with all these jellyfish-like bubbles and all that stuff. The lower the dissipation value is, the longer your smoke will retain its kind of like density volume value. So here's our pyrosolver simulation and let's check how it looks. This is how it looks. Now we have this pyrosim and we can feed it into our pop network. So we get another input from our sphere and we set it to scatter. I forced the total count to be 2000. You can try with a 500 or something. It will be just faster. And here we need a point wrangle and we need to assign an attribute. And this technique here with these strands, I found it a long time ago from um, CGWiki or Tokerdu. So definitely check that. It has a lot of kind of like sample scenes and you can just like go through it, modify and uh, and just kind of understand how things actually work. So we need this attribute to create actual curves later. So basically we are assigning point number to our custom name and attribute PTID. And this is crucial and I will explain you why we are doing that just a bit later. So then we drop a pop network and here is the setup. I organized this also um, a bit. So let's check what we have here. Our source forced input. Emission type set to all points. Geometry source is set to use first context geometry. In the burst, I want these particles to be emitted until the frame number four. So first three frames, we are emitting the particles. That's why there is a dollar SF simulation frame less than four. Then we drop a pop advect by volumes. And here we set the velocity source to be SOP. We then target our pyro solver. Field name velocity is default. Advection type is set to update velocity, not update force or update position. And velocity blend to set to 0.5. It's, I think it's by default. And then we drop a SOP solver. I can show you what we get without the SOP solver. So let's play that simulation. It's like that. We kind of see that we have these particles moving in the in the range of advection, but we need curves, right? We don't need particles. So that's why let's enable the sub solver. To the dop geometry, we need to attach the add node. Here you see we have three tabs, points, polygons, particles. We go to the polygons and go to the by group tab and change this add dropdown value to by attribute. An attribute name is our PTID. It's not nearly a complete result, but you see that we have some curves between the points. Why we need this attribute? Because if I type ptnum here, it doesn't work. And we have a warning here, invalid attribute specification ptnum, because we don't have that attribute here. So that's why ptid. So now we kind of connect the points by their PTID, but that's not good because we have some points that were pushed by their velocity too far and we are connecting these points that are really far away from each other and we don't have any sort of subdivisions or smooth lines. Then we can add a resample node and by default, if you add the re resample node and you dial, let's say here in the lengths you dial, 0.05, this resample node will be messing with all the particles we are adding in these three frames while we are emitting. And that's why um, it looks really strange and we we have too many particles or curves appearing here. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird result here. And the magic checkbox is here. Create only points. If we check that, we can resim it. Now you see that we have all these particles that already look like lines. 
After that, we will need to drop a convert line node and compute length set to rest length. It's, it's a default parameter, just drop that convert line. Now we can go back from our popnet and let's play the simulation once more. This looks cool to me. So now we drop an add node. Here you can see it's, it's an add node, uh, just like the one we dropped in the popnet. I just renamed it to Curves Appear. The magic behind this add node is because we did a resample in the popnet, we actually have our attributes PTID in a correct way and we can just go through these points that have these attributes PTID and they will connect into beautiful and subdivided curves. So let me show you once again. Now we just need to colorize them and we can do that by attribute. So we have our PTID and the range should be from 0 to your force total count value here. And actually we can do a better way. So right click to the force total count and click copy parameter. And here in the color you can double click this value 2000 which is our total count of the particles right click on that and choose paste relative references and now if you change this total count the upper value of the range of our color ramp also will change automatically and we can probably do that for all the colors paste relative references all good here so for the gradients here here's a magic button so you can do any sort of gradients and i think this one is some sort of uh, i know it's maybe a twilight or something but you see that you can get pretty cool results just by yeah clicking these i think it was inferno yeah it's inferno but modified a bit so yeah there are four color variations for this one. And then I again cache that out 240 frames. Um, so the rendering on the farm is faster. And by the way, this project was also rendered on Fox Farm. And these guys are again killing that with that speed and price. So 150 frames cost me around 12 bucks. This one is for the second take, second camera angle and 240 frames took me 15 bucks. Here I'm rendering 10 frames per one node and here I'm rendering 5 frames per one node. So it's up to you. You can render that 10 or 5. I'm just like still testing that. But this farm is seriously good and you can find my affiliate link down in the description. I know that sounds unreal, but if you want your renders done fast and cheap, check these guys out. Now back to our redshift setup. So I have three redshift lights here in this scene. Uh, one, two, and three. All of them are kind of like standard. And I'm not a Redshift Pro. This is my second project using Redshift. So my settings might not be the best ones. If you have any comments regarding the Redshift, you're more than welcome to share your knowledge with me in the comments below. Here I have two cameras. One is my kind of like a main shot. And the second one is this, this close up shot here. For the materials, um, I think here we have our redshift network and I have just one material which gets the CD attribute from the particles, feeds that to the material, adjusted the roughness a bit and yeah, that's basically it. For my geo here, I set the render to be strands with a global scale multiplier set to 0.4. And yeah, my material is here with the render settings. I'm using uh, minimum samples set to 256, max samples to 1024, overriding reflections and lights, globals. And for the global illumination, trace depth set to 4, brute force set to 2048, caustics uh, disabled. Let's fire up our render view to check if everything's good here. Yep, so this is our second camera. Let's get back to cam 1. And we have this, yeah, this beautiful, beautiful setup. All right, guys, so that's it for today. If you enjoy my tutorials, I will be very glad to see your like on this video. Subscribe to my channel and click the bell so you don't miss the notifications about new tutorials. Remember, I am doing these two times a week and I am able to do that only because of you guys support me and purchase my project files. And I am really grateful to every one of you. I will be back very soon. 
Bye.